put in this order. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the House Government and um, House Health and Government Operations Committee um, to our afternoon of bill hearings. Uh, I will remind folks this is a virtual committee meeting, so I ask for your patience if we encounter any technological or streaming issues. The bill hearing is being streamed on the Maryland uh, General Assembly's YouTube channel. Um, committee members, remember, even though we're on Zoom, please adhere to our usual committee rules of one question and one answer from a panel, not one question and one answer from each panelist. Um, we will allow brief follow-up questions, but keep your questions shorter than the expected answer. In terms of timing this afternoon, the bill sponsor or designee will be allotted five minutes to present the bill. Up to five witnesses will each be given two minutes to speak in support. Um, we will then have, if, if, um, if there are those who are there to speak uh, favorable with amendments, they will be allowed to speak in the second panel for two minutes each. And thirdly, um, those who want to speak in opposition, up to five witnesses will be given two minutes um, to speak in opposition. And after each panel, the, um, co the committee will have the opportunity to ask questions. So we are starting today with House Bill 612, Delegate Lasanti, and this is Office of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, Responsibilities and Reporting. Delegate Lasanti, welcome to HGO. Sorry, she just joined the Zoom. Oh, okay. Uh, Delegate Lasanti. You there yet? Yes, ma'am. There we go. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. <laughs> Madam, uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, the honorable members of the committee, it is my pleasure to bring to you House Bill 668, uh, notice of, to the state delegation of the removal of a health officer. Most Marylanders agree that public health should not be a political issue. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong bill. Oh, I was going to say this didn't sound like 612. <laughs> Madam Chair, may I take may I uh, may I come back to you in just a moment? I'm sorry. I have the wrong file in front of me. Um, uh, how long will it take? Um, 25, th one minute. One minute. Um, OK, well, rather than move on, we will. Well, where's the file? Can I go ahead and ask my question now, Madam Chair? <laughs> of course. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I apologize. This is one of those uh, technical difficulties that we spoke about um, when we opened the meeting. Okay. Oh, delegate, you ready? Uh, I yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you, and I okay. apologize to the committee. I pulled the wrong file, and uh, and that's where I am. And this is House Bill six twelve, correct? This is House Bill six twelve. Thank you very much. And this is regarding the Office of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Last year, if you recall, I brought a bill to this committee to deal with the issue of accessibility of hearing aids. One of the things that um, that I discovered through working with you and the committee and the subcommittee on this bill is that, um, that we don't have a real good handle on how many deaf and hard of hearing Marylanders there really are. So the, this bill seeks to change that. This basically is, is looking at the governor's office of deaf and hard of hearing and the scope of their services. And I met with the office to try to figure out how they approach um, private citizens who are having problems accessing technology. We have a, we have a lot of issues that have um, come out through COVID for accessing technology in our schools. 
and how proactively they are working with, um, with our deaf and hard of hearing community to try to help them uh, sort through their issues because they are, are changing on a regular basis. I, um, I, I think that hearing is one of those issues that we all take for granted. And as I've gotten older, I take my, my sight for granted because now I have to, I have to wear glasses when I, when I testify. But having to, having to reconcile the um, not hearing really is a very difficult problem for many Marylanders to, um, to, to deal with. So simply this bill is, just expands the, the scope and modernizes the scope of work within the, the Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing to allow them to look at more contemporary issues and give them a little bit more latitude to be able to help these most vulnerable Marylanders. I have a panel with me today that's gonna to talk about their individual problems and how maybe we can um, enlarge the scope of the governor's office to be able to uh, meet their needs. So with that, Madam Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak to you today. And I apologize for, uh, for my delay in presenting. Delegate, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Delegate. Um, your uh, panelist, Mr. Pupilo, is not able to be here, but Jane Bellmeyer is. So we'll call Jane Bellmeyer. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. All right, I'm trying to bring up my script and the computer is not playing with me. Those technological glitches, right? Yes. Oh, here we go, here we go, got it, got it, okay. So about two years ago, my otherwise healthy 27-year-old son walked through the door of a local store in our neighborhood in Rising Sun and the sound in his right ear just disappeared. It was just poof, gone like a finger snap from Thanos in a Marvel movie. Um, we thought it was an ear infection, so he went to the doctor. Antibiotics and steroids did nothing. So he went to an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and the diagnosis was one I'd never heard before, SSHL, sudden sensory neural hearing loss. No cause, no cure. Here's a young man who works full-time in a bank as its head teller. Can he do his job without a hearing aid now? No way. So here I am, almost 63. I've been wearing hearing aids since February of 1978. I work full-time as a newspaper reporter. Before that, I spent 25 years in radio. Can I do that job without hearing aids? No way. So when my hearing aids are not working properly, I get depressed. I cannot hear well with only one working aid. If I'm not wearing either, I have only about 15% of my natural hearing. That's one five, 15%. And that, by medical terms, is considered profound hearing loss. Hearing aids are my only way of being a normal, working, volunteering, interacting, tax-paying person. So the set I'm wearing right now, I paid $4,000 for out of my own pocket. The previous set I had was $5,400, and that lasted more than eight years. That one I got with help from the, from the government, from the, um, the what was it? It's, uh, then now it's called DOORS, Development. Um, division or Department of Rehabilitative Services. Back then I had two kids in my house and I qualified for aid. Now I don't, my kids are grown. So I had to pay $4,000 out of my own pocket for my aids. Let's do the math, say $5,400. Over eight years of the life of the hearing aids, that's $675 a year for the cost spread out. But I also wear glasses, as you can tell. I have hearing, I have vision insurance for that which allows me new frames every two years, new lenses every year. And that costs me about $400 every other year. I don't understand why hearing aids are not included in the cost of health insurance. According to Johns Hopkins Hospital in 2016, there were 1.2 million Maryland residents, 12 and older, who identified as deaf or hard, hard of hearing. So why are we being ignored or disrespected? Is it because we're basically invisible? I mean, I don't walk with a red tip cane. I don't roll around on wheels. I don't walk on prosthetics, so I can't be handicapped, right? I am handicapped because there are so many others around like me walking around who are shut off from the world because they can't hear and they can't afford hearing aids. 
We are not handicapped by our hearing loss. We're handicapped by a state that ignores the request of the hearing impaired to help us. We're not looking for free hearing aids. We're asking you to, for you to require that our health insurers chip in to help us. It's hearing health, it's mental health, it's emotional health, and it's the right thing to do. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there questions from the committee for the delegate and her panelist? Um, delegate Hill. Thank you. Um, the Delegate Lasanti, thank you for this. I'm actually trying to work on something for kids in school uh, and the, the provision and the, the hearing piece, we've had a harder time to wrap around. So the fiscal note talks about the 1.2 million um, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry about that. There we uh, go. Thank you, Delegate Lasante. Um, I was just singing, I'm working on uh, making sure that our kids in school get vision support and hearing support. We've had a hard time with that. So the fiscal note talks about the 1.2 million uh, that Ms. Uh, Bellmeyer referenced that the uh, office says we have in Maryland. It's based on a 2019 study but it doesn't give us a true number. It's a national study and everything else is extrapolated going to the uh, website of the governor's um, office on uh, deaf and hard of hearing Marylanders. So what, I, what I'm curious about is, would you be open to an amendment that required, instead of just knowing the number, which they've estimated, but actually knowing the number of children or an estimate of the number of children uh, who are deaf or hard of hearing and have not received uh, hearing aids or hearing supports, or for that matter, in addition to the denominator of the, of the estimate for adults as well, it, would it not be important to also know how many of them are going without uh, hearing supports? I'm not talking about kids. Oh. I know you. I know. I was asking Delegate Lasante. Yeah. Right, Ms. Ben Meyer, you might want to mute. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Delegate Hill. Thank you very much. And absolutely, I, I would welcome that as a friendly amendment. I, in drafting this bill, I really um, th there's a lot of criteria that I think that we would want to know. Uh, I'm looking to the expertise of this committee, to, um, as as you are the subject matter experts in in particularly health related issues. Um, I, I welcome that type of specificity. So thank you very much because I really, the more that I have worked on this bill and, and as we say, you know, crack, um, crack, uh, peel back the onion, there's many, many layers here that really we're, we're not digging into. And in my conversation um, with the, um, the director, you know, look, he, they've done a great job of, uh, of doing things um, for, uh, for this community. However, um, they have really not, the, the scope of their office has not been updated in over 20 years. So times have changed um, and accessibility issues have changed. So I think anything we can do to specifically amend onto this bill, what it is that you as a committee in particular need to know about these 1.2 Marylanders who, who are really a growing number of underserved uh, Thank you. citizens. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Um, Delegate Krebs. Thank you. I'm reading the bill and then I'm listening to the testament. I'm a little confused, but the bill basically only says we're going to maintain an estimate of the number of deaf and hard of hearing individuals in the state. And then identifying and facilitating opportunities for the underinsured individuals. So it's really about reporting. But then I'm reading the fiscal note and the, the fiscal note says that the director of the Office of Hearing and Deaf must submit an annual report to the governor um, that explains the activities of the office, the status of the programs, statistics, and then recommendations for improved delivery of services for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. So has that report come out? And is there anything in that report that, that, that helps with the issues at hand? Because it sounds like we're already getting a report or we're supposed to have it. And, and it's not in here, but have you looked at that report? And is there anything in there that would glean some help for this this group of folks? That's the problem is the report is very general and um, it's not distributed widely through the General Assembly. It may go to the governor, but um, I haven't seen it. Um, I've asked, you know, it, it may be on their website, but as far as, you know, we get reports from every state, lots of state agencies on their progress yearly. And 
this one does seems to fall through the cracks. So that's one of the reasons that it's it's explicit in the bill that they also uh, make that report available to the General Assembly. Well, we obviously missed the ball when we it required the report before to be distributed to us, but I would suggest us or you guys trying to get us to copy this report to see if it's deficient or does it have information in there that we can act on? I think, it's, already, pretty I think already... it's pretty vague, but I think that uh, okay. we certainly can get that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any, thank you, delegate. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on HB 612. Thank you, thank Delegate you Lasante, for thank bringing us much. that bill. Uh, we will move to House Bill 663, um, Delegate Kaiser, State Government, um, Notorial Acts, Fees and Use of Communication Technology. Delegate Kaiser. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, esteemed colleagues on the HGO committee. Uh, it's good to be here on this bill today. I'll be uh, relatively brief uh, about um, really trying to update and make uh, notarization easier, more streamlined, and meet the updated realities of our current workforce. I think we all learned a whole lot of things during the pandemic, uh, obviously not just the bad things, but some of the good things and some of the ways we can streamline the work that we can do. And I have uh, three people testifying today who will provide uh, the expertise on this. Uh, this bill does three main things plus a fee issue. One of them is it uh, simplifies the process for identity proofing, which will be uh, further explained. Uh, it uh, extends the right to electronic notarization for wills and trusts, as the committee members right may remember that uh, we can do that for other documents in the past two years. And it permits something called remote ink notarizations. Uh, lastly, it does give the Secretary of State the ability to increase the current fees from the $4, but to no more than $25. And I just want to uh, point out here uh, that when using the electronic services, notaries rely on outside vendors and, and that's costing more than $4 a transaction. So they wanna be able to increase it. They won't be able to increase it too much. Uh, this bill does have a, a broad group of stakeholders that are supporting this um, and it will really bring notaries uh, into the 21st century. And uh, I cede the rest of my time, if I can, to uh, my, the next person testifying. Certainly you may. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Christine Hubbard. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Hubbard. I am the chair elect of the Maryland State Bar Association Estate and Trust Law Section here in favor of House Bill 663. So this, this bill seeks to do four things, four minor amendments to Maryland's revised uniform law on notarial acts, what we call RELONA. I'm gonna cover two and my colleague Sarah Call will cover two. The first thing it does is to remove the exclusion of wills and trusts from being electronically notarized. We have a new electronic will statute that requires electronic wills to be electronically notarized. Because of the exclusion in Rolona, we cannot use our electronic will statute. The good thing to know is that our electronic will statute has ample safeguards in place against abuse, including the requirement that the entire execution process be overseen by a uh, Maryland licensed attorney. So because of these safeguards, we really do think that it's, it's safe and it's time to allow electronic notarization of wills and trusts. The, the second thing that this bill does is to correct a conflict in two sections of Rolona. One section states that when a notary is undertaking an electronic notarization, they have to ID the signer based on personal knowledge, affirmation of a credible witness, or presenting identification such as a driver's license. And it says only if you use that third element do you have to go through an expensive and time-consuming credential analysis and identity proofing? The problem is that another section of Rolona says broadly that all electronic notarizations require the credential analysis and identity proofing. So this bill corrects for that and makes it clear that you only have to jump through those hoops when you use that presentation of ID. So for these reasons and those expressed that will be expressed by Sarah, I ask for a favorable report on House Bill 663. Thank you, Ms. Hubbard. Um, Sarah Call, please. 
Yes, thank you, uh, members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is Sarah Call, and I am also representing the Estates and Trust Law Section of the MSBA in support of House Bill 663. Uh, under the emergency order to sign estate planning documents that required a notary, we were permitted to use a remote ink notarization known as a RIN, and this bill would allow RINs to continue. A RIN mimics the process for an in-person notarization and does not require our clients to be particularly tech savvy or have a specialized notary. So having the safety and ease of using a um, audio visual platform, but also the simplicity of using pen and paper um, has really been more useful to estate practitioners. Um, we appreciate having the option of both a remote online notarization um, or a remote ink notarization, um, but the pen and paper route has been the one that our members have come to rely on especially. I also want to draw your attention to the section of the bill dealing with fees for notaries. Um, as Delegate Kaiser pointed out, the bill allows the Secretary of State more discretion in allowing notaries um, what the notaries may charge. This is especially important for notaries that are performing um, remote services that require a subscription. That $4 fee that they could charge means that a lot of the notaries were losing money on each notarization they performed. And so that is why it was was particularly important for us because we were having difficulty finding notaries who were willing to, to do it. So um, to be clear, the bill doesn't require the maximum rate to be um, increased, but it does allow the Secretary of State to increase those fees up to that $25 um, in the case of standard notarization or $50 in the case of remote or electronic. So to allow clients um, to take advantage of remote notarization and allow remote notaries to be accessible, I encourage a favorable report for House Bill 663. Thank you, Ms. Call. Uh, Deborah Howe. Good afternoon, and thank you um, for your time. I am a, an attorney, um, a states and trust attorney here in Maryland, and also a member of the states and trust section of the Maryland State Bar Association. And I am here to ask for a favorable report on House Bill 663. Uh, Chris and Sarah both did an excellent job describing some of the technical changes that this bill does. I wanna focus on um, the practical requirement and practical necessity. As Delegate Kaiser referenced, you know, there were some positives that came out of COVID. Um, and one of them was that we learned how to do things remotely. And what I have seen with my clients is that I have young clients who um, the time to take off work and find childcare that is required for them to come into my office and complete an estate plan, an estate plan that is critical, especially for young families, um, was a big hurdle where, um, you know, during the pandemic, when we had the emergency orders in place, I was able to meet with those individuals individually. It was um, not intrusive into their, um, you know, their schedules. They didn't have to travel to my office. Um, and we were able to complete an estate plan that got guardians in place in the case that they died with minor children or, um, you know, set up um, trusts to hold assets for their children. Uh, similarly, I have many elderly clients that even without the threat of a global pandemic, the travel and um, exposure um, coming to my office can be prohibitive. Uh, this amendment makes remote notarizations possible, but it also makes them accessible to these individuals. And when um, making sure that you know these, these families, these elderly individuals have access to attorneys for estate planning, um, I would encourage the committee to, con to consider this really a necessary um, change and update to the law to make sure that we have the tools necessary to, to serve um, these different groups in the population. So for those reasons, I would ask for a favorable report from this committee on House Bill 663. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Howe. Um, that concludes the, the sponsor's panel. Are there questions of this panel? Delegate Chisholm. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, real quick question. Didn't we pass this bill last year? Just from my own knowledge, I could have sworn we passed this same exact bill last year. And, and I remember because I'm a, I'm a recovering mortgage lender <laughs> and remember a lot, but I, I was just asking, I, I did want to ask about that and what happened to it. Um, this bill did a similar bill 
passed the Senate last year, but it did not pass HGO last year. Okay. So we are reintroducing it. We, are, we actually made it better than last year. It's a bit more streamlined. And um, it's also more in line with the Uniform Law, Uniform Law Commission's guidelines with respect to remote ink notarizations. So, so yes, you have heard this before, but it was not passed, unfortunately. And that's one of the reasons why we have this conflict with our new electronic will statute that requires electronic notarizations, yet we cannot perform electronic notarizations of wills. So y yes, you, you've heard it before, but it did not pass. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Saab. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's a great bill. My only concern or question, and maybe you can comment on that, when it comes to wills, I think someone, you know, how do you, is there a specific list of questions that you have to ask to make sure that the person that's signing the will is not being forced to sign it? Or, you know, somebody, I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of disputes where people say, I didn't sign, the, sign it, or they did, and under what mental capacity they have to be. So is there like requirements that you have to ask before you're actually gonna uh, you know, notarize it? Um, you know, all of that is really addressed under our new electronic will statute that, that did pass last year. So um, there are layers of safeguards in place. Uh, as the Maryland State Bar Association, Estates and Trust Law Section, our top priority is always at least most of ours is preventing abuse. We want to make take every every angle possible looking at this thing to make sure that there are are uh, mi we minimize. We can never prevent abuse, even if you're sitting there at the table. You're never going to prevent all abuse, but we you know try our darndest to make sure that there are ample safeguards in place. So in that electronic will statute. There is a requirement that a Maryland licensed attorney oversee the entire execution process. And they have to actually create a certification that they sign, that they have gone through the various different steps outlined in that electronic will statute to identify the, the signer, the, the testator, testatrix, along with the witnesses, um, make sure everybody is signing appropriately. Then they have to assemble the will and attach their certification. And there's also a self-proving affidavit. So our electronic will statute is one of, if not the most rigorous in the, in the country. So um, I, I think we have done through those safeguards almost everything you can do to help prevent abuse. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Bagno. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for this bill. Um, I, I, I also recall, like my colleague, um, uh, that one of the concerns, oh, sorry, I keep taking my hand down and then um, putting it back up, I apologize. Um, one of the concerns was going from that $4 to $25, and I see now that we, we're also looking at, at $50 um, for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the, the remote, um, and I'm, and I, I looked for it in the bill, maybe it's in there and I just didn't see it, but is there is there a review process uh, to see if the new fees are working? Because I know that there was a concern about an access issue when we're going from $4 for um, notary to 20, to potentially 25. And I know it's not prescriptive that we're not required to do that, but is there a review process with new fees and or would you be amenable to considering a review process to make sure that we're not locking people out uh, thank you for that question, Delegate Bagnell. I would say on the first part, uh, no, I would not be, I, I would be amenable. Uh, I think it's fine. I think leaving it to the Secretary of State's office to um, have that authority over time to uh, increase it modestly, maybe a few years from now, more than that, and they would have that authority. I also believe that um, people are able to waive those fees when there's someone who is, is low income. And I think that authority is already there. And I Fortunately, see Christine nodding to that part. But yes, I think I think that would be fine. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Delegate Salega. Thank you. Um, and uh, going off of what Delegate Bagnell said, can you remind us the last time these fees were raised? 
So I do you... not know the last time Sarah, I mean, uh, Sarah <laughs> or, or Deb, have you any, uh, any idea? They are so antiquated mm -hmm. that people are really losing money, especially with electronic notarizations. On average, it costs about $25 to pay for these remote vendors to handle electronic notarization. Plus there are annual fees. So those who are doing the electronic notarizations are, are really losing money every time they're performing the notarization. We're driving people to other states because we're, it's hard to find those who are you know, willing to do it in Maryland. Yeah, and we're I, not regulating when we send them away you know, we, there's no borders for e-notarizations. We can be in uh, Indiana or, you know, Florida. Mm -hmm. So that is an issue. We want to keep it in Maryland. We want to be able to regulate notaries here. Um, yeah, I think I was a notary. I gave my notary up last year, but um, I've been a notary for 25 years and it's been $4 for 25 years. I didn't charge <laughs> it. Like you said, it's voluntary. You don't have to charge someone. It's up to... But, um, you know, the training is, is more, the getting someone licensed is more, um, I would just say that this is very reasonable to go to $25 with the max of 50. So, you know, some documents need multiple notarization. So I'm glad you included a, a ceiling of $50, um, but I think that barely even covers your cost to do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think Thank it's you. important yeah. to recognize that this bill doesn't increase the fees. It simply authorizes the Secretary of State to increase the fees based on those parameters. So they can, you know, from time to time, work up, up a scale uh, based on what they perceive to be necessary. Thank you. Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I remember the bill that we're all talking about. It, it they were talking about going up to $25 per service. So how much are we charging now? And do you see the in-person notaries going away? And is the $4 still adequate for the in-person notary? I believe it is not adequate for in-person notary. So the way the new bill handles it is that for in-person, it can go up to $25. For electronic notarizations, it can go up to 50. But you know, even, even for an uh, in-person notary now, four dollars that's been around for, you know, it's well over 25 years, really doesn't cover it. I think people have to bake in their notarization fees into other fees, which is really not fair. Um, you know, how, how can anybody afford to travel to or entertain someone to do a notarization for $4. So it's, it's really very antiquated. Okay, thank you. Uh, Delegate Hill, and then we're going to move on. Delegate thank Hill. Thank you. Yeah, so since um, generally speaking, people have to have something notarized, they don't get a choice, right? They have to have it notarized. Um, so all the fee discussion is important. Having the ceiling and the flexibility, I think is important. What I'm not clear about is whether the secretary is in the office actually do surveys to find out what people are charging. Um, and if we know, because I know most of the people I know who've worked as notary, my mother was one for 20, 30 years, the bank does notary, they do it for nothing, it's a service. They're not trying to make a living off of being a notary. Um, and there may be some people who are, but I think a lot of the discussion has been as if this is covering their fees because this is how they're making a living. So does the secretary actually keep track of what's being charged by different notaries to get a sense of, even if it's not covering the electronic fee, it may not matter if they're a bank, right? You know, in, in all honesty, I do not know how they keep, keep track. I don't know the, the logistics of how that actually happens, but. Um, last year and this year, we worked very closely with um, Michael Schleen and others in the Secretary of State's office to make sure that um, this was something that their office is uh, embracing and you know would, would facilitate having um, 
Marylanders have greater access to notarizations. I don't, I don't think their goal is to um, drive the fees up. I think it's a balance, but I, I really, I can get back to you on that, but I don't know the, the answer to that one. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And if you, and Ms. Hubbard, if you get information, if you'd please send it to the, the committees, to uh, Chairman Pendergrass and she'll distribute that to the committee. Um, I have a quick question for the sponsor. Do you have any um, information on the Secretary of State position on the bill? Um, I do not, but I'm thinking that uh, one of the others may have that information. Yes, we before we presented this bill to uh, Chair Pendergrass and, and others, we made sure that the stakeholders all agreed to it. So yes, we worked closely with the Secretary of State State's office. They have reviewed and approved this bill. Um, Josie Yusek at the Attorney General's office, counsel to the Secretary of State, reviewed and approved it. The real real property uh, section of the bar also reviewed and approved it. Bill O'Connell's taking the lead there. So we did make sure, this is such an important bill to us. We wanted to make sure that all of the stakeholders that were involved approved it before we even presented it to you. Um, we, we, there, there is no opposition. I think that's very important that we, we uh, really tried to flush all of that out before we um, put it in final form and presented it. Thank you for that, those efforts. Um, Delegate Rosenberg. On mute. Perhaps it could be helpful to the subcommittee's consideration of this bill. If Ms. Hubbard, if you were able to get in writing, uh, especially from the Secretary of State, uh, their position or this, the sponsor, however, but I think it would be helpful for them to let the committee know uh, what their position is and the other parties you reference, the AG, uh, and so on, what their position is on this bill. Thank you, sure. Delegate. Not, not a problem. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you all very much. That concludes the hearing on uh, House Bill 663. Thank you all for coming and testifying today. Thank you. And we are going to move to House Bill 760. This is Delegate Krebs. States of emergency and catastrophic health emergencies, renewal, authorization by General Assembly or Legislative Policy Committee. Delegate Krebs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Delegate Krebs from Carroll County uh, with states of emergency and catastrophic health emergency renewals. Basically, this is sort of a, I say a cleanup bill. Um, when we left here two years ago, um, we've never really been in this situation before the legislature and the governor declared a state of emergency. We all went along with it and we've learned a lot through that state of emergency. Uh, it gave the governor powers that he needed, and we've learned a lot of things. And we've extended some, as we talked about in the last bill, we've extended some policies and procedures as a result of that have been a benefit to us. Um, but it was we were in uncharted territory. And the reason we even got the ability for the governor to have a state of emergency a number of years ago was after 9-11. Uh, so the General Assembly, in the wake of the uh, September 9-11 uh, um, attacks, the General Assembly passed a bill in 2002 that enhanced the governor's emergency powers, allowing them to immediately assume emergency powers in the event or threat or occurrence of an enemy attack, act of terrorism or public health catastrophe. And it allowed him to have a state of emergency for 30 days and then keep extending it for 30 days. But the COVID-19 pandemic um, state of emergency was the first time these powers have been used in such an expansive manner, touching virtually every part of Mariners' lives. And in many ways, it was positive. It was a positive, things that we gave them the ability to do. But I, I think we've learned that, you know, we the legislative branch like to have some say in, in things that are going on. Again, I'm not disputing how it was handled because I think we did, learned a lot of good things from uh, the emergency powers. But I think there's room for improvement in the process. And no matter who is uh, applying the, occupying the governor's office, under the founding principle of balance of powers between the three separate co-equal branches of government, the legislature, us, as direct representatives of the people should have a role. And you say, what would that role be? This bill basically requires the approval of the Maryland General Assembly to extend the state of emergency beyond the 60 days, the first, the, the first 30 days and then the renewal 
And then the governor uh, would have to come back to the General Assembly and just explain why they need to ex extend it. And you say, gosh, well, what if we're not here? You know, whatever. So in there, it, the General Assembly is not required to meet in person. The approval can be granted through the Legislative Policy Committee, which is comprised of our presiding officers, our committee chairs, and floor leadership from the minority and majority parties. And it will just ensure that the legislative branch at least is asking the questions, you know, why this renewal is needed. And it gives us, the legislative branch, a say and it ensures the balance of power uh, that, that's in place. We did pass a bill last year, or I believe, that allows the General Assembly to terminate a state of emergency at any time by joint resolution. Um, this would sort of this would sort of make it just with any renewal that there would be some discussion of here's why we need to renew it. And again, the Legislative Policy Committee, if we're not in, um, in session, would be that body. And it's just an accountability and it puts us, the legislative branch, in a, in, in a role in these states of emergency and, and sort of gives the support to the governor uh, of, you know, in these states of emergency that we're behind it. So that's what the, um, that's what the bill does, is procedural in nature. And um, I hope that we, uh, you know, learn from this and strengthen our states of emergency so we can include our branch of government, the legislative, uh, the legislative branch, when, when these decisions are made. Thank you, Delegate. Um, Vince McAvoy, please. All right, thank you, uh, Delegate Colson. Thank you, Delegate Krebs, for bringing this bill. Hope you all can hear me okay. Got some yes, background noise today, thank you. Um, I thank you for bringing this bill. And committee, I ask you to, to hear this bill and hear it out. Um, we have a separation of powers and, and you all have that, that stick when people are out of line. You can act throughout the year. You often do on issues, uh, even outside of term. You all have been active in other issues. Unfortunately, when you were active in these issues going on, things like unemployment didn't get addressed. What this bill would do would say that things have gone on long enough and that you could keep things in check as you should. Uh, there's a, a, a gentlemanly notion to Annapolis that these powers when granted were, were gonna be given for the good of the people and in accord with, with common reasonable expectations. They were meant, never meant to be given to like an abusive father who was going to use a stick and basically smother people, businesses, transit, the very essence of what it is to be essential or non-essential, these type of concepts. This was never meant to be. And so what we saw for the first time, and many of us were, were understanding at first because we thought that this power, this grand power, this is a, a power of, of one person of government running everything uh, that was given will be handled in a gentlemanly way and with common sense and in accord with the constitution. This would be a safeguard because obviously that will not be the case 100% of the time. And the damage that was done to the state in many ways irreparable and that we're, we're struggling through this right now this type of bill would have, would have helped so many things, so many people that I see struggle, so many businesses that were shut down. So once again, I ask you to earnestly consider this in the backdrop. I thank you, Delegate Krebs and committee. Hey, thank you very much, Mr. McAvoy. Um, questions from the committee? Last call, questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the hearing on House Bill 760. Thank you uh, for your, bringing us the bill and your testimony, sir. Uh, we will move to House Bill 767, sponsored by Delegate Rosenberg, Emergency Procurement, Contracts, Term Length, and Renewal. Delegate Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the HGO Committee. Um, we are well aware because of what we've read in the newspapers and briefings that we've had, uh, that there have been at least two uh, emergency contracts with serious flaws uh, that were entered into uh, in our response to the pandemic. And at one of those briefings, I asked uh, Gregory Hook, who is the chair, excuse me, the director of uh, the legislature's office of legislative audits, what could we do to address problems with, the, with such emergency procurements? Uh, and his response, his verbal response was to limit the length 
of such procurements. And that's what House Bill 6, 767 would do. It would very clearly limit a contract term for an emergency procurement to six months. And then a procurement officer could not renew a contract executed under the emergency procedures after the expiration of the six month contract term, thereby mandating uh, a second look at that contract. Uh, it couldn't just be renewed for another period uh, of time, uh, even say another six months. Uh, so I think this provides for the kind of review that I think has been made evident to us as being necessary uh, when emergency contracts are entered into. Um, there is a letter sent to, all, to the committee, a letter of information from the Maryland Department of Transportation that cites certain circumstances where a six month limitation would be uh, inappropriate. And I would suggest that there is language in the bill, but we certainly welcome further discussion uh, with MDOT and with any other agency that wishes to appear before uh, this, this subcommittee if we take up this bill subsequent to this hearing. But that uh, the bill I believe does provide in nine uh, Roman numeral two that uh, a procurement officer shall use a procurement method listed under existing provisions of the law if the six month uh, process or limitation uh, is not appropriate. So to give us a, an articulated enumerated statutory review that does not exist now uh, for emergency contracts, but allows them to be entered into, but mandates an appropriate review before they are extended beyond that six month period uh, I would urge favorable report on House Bill 767. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Um, I'd like to call Richard Medina. That was supposed to be taken off. He's not testifying. Oh, he's not testifying. Okay. Then are there, I see there are questions for the sponsor of the bill. Um, Delegate Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I remember we had this audit review and it, it was so stunning to me that I actually keep it on my, my desktop because they looked at 15 different emergency procurements. And in those 15, only one had all the items accounted for, only four follow compliance and only eight effectively looked at the contract. So obviously we have a serious problem with emergency procurement. My only concern, um, Delegate Rosenberg is, you know, I, I know you said we're going to oversee this and we do these audits. Where's the teeth is which my, what my concern is. I mean, we all know that there's a problem and we always say, well, we'll review it. And then we review these things and say, yeah, there was a problem. But I don't know where, what our recourse is and, and who really is. Who, who do we trust to oversee it and do the review? And how do we prevent it from happening in the future? Because we were talking about in that audit, that was $200 million that they just looked at. I think everybody on this committee knows how upset I was about us wiring money to a foreign country in the middle of the night. I mean, this is stuff that should not happen. This is taxpayers' dollars in the end run. And I, I want to make sure if we put a bill like this in, that it means something. And so I guess I'm asking you for how do you reassure the public? How do we reassure the public that it's going to be handled correctly? Excellent question. I think what the bill says is, we're, well, we're relying on the existing contract review process to be effective at that six month point. Now, so I'm not trying to, we're saying after six months, you've got to review it. You've got to resubmit and different contract that gets, that is not done, well, that can be done in certain circumstances because that's the exception that I pointed out. But we're trying to, we're not 
altering the normal review process, but saying we're not, but we're not waiting for the audit process, which is sporadic. That is, it doesn't happen as a matter of course, as a matter of fact, for every emergency contract. So this is saying for every emergency contract, there has to be a review after six months. I am open to strengthening that review in a way that doesn't put a, you know, get in the way of the contracts that need to be renewed at that six month period. But it's also true that a smart procurement officer doesn't wait till six months, you know, to, to try and get renewal of these contracts. It just, forces the process to take a look at these emergency contracts sooner and on a regular basis and in every instance, which doesn't happen now. I hope Madam that answers Chair, your question. Madam Chair, if I can just say one more thing. Certainly, um, sir. And that's my concern, Delegate, is the normal review process did not work. And how do we know it's going to work in the future? And once again, I know that we kind of lose sight of this, but it is the taxpayer's money we're spending. Mm -hmm. And it was an easy, it was just an easy excuse. Well, we're under a um, state of emergency, so we can kind of do whatever we want. And that's that's not how we should be responsibly handling the taxpayer's money. Well, I would just I agree. This bill just mandates a review process every six months. Okay. Or at the end of the six months. It we can perhaps improve it, but at a minimum, this bill says six months, you got to make a change. You can't right. just continue the way you've been going. Okay, thank okay. you, Delegate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Delegate. Uh, Delegate Robin Lewis, please. There Here we go. go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Delegate Rosenberg for this bill. My question is, had a bill like this been in effect during the onset of the pandemic, would it have been helpful? Would it have allowed the state to avoid some of the um, um, missteps that we saw happen with procurement? That's my intent. Uh, that's my expectation. And I guess what supports that is there would have everybody involved in the procurement process. Uh, in the executive branch would have been obligated, legally obligated to review these contracts six months before the six months, because you can't start the review and have the, you know, that review process has to start before the six month period ends. So it doesn't guarantee that we won't have such contracts in the future, but it does make it far more likely that there's going to be a review of every emergency contract fairly early on in less than six months from its signing and approval. And if I may, Madam Chair, very quick follow up. Would the review, because um, I've done some state procurements, not as much as other people have, but I'm of a little familiarity, but would the review be done by the same people who um, signed off on the procurement or who sought the procurement? Could you talk about how the, that part would work? That sounds like a good amendment. Seems like, yeah, because otherwise it's just like, you know, the, 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 the animals yeah. running the, the animal shelter kind of thing. So, okay. Well, I, I would I, say, I would quote Professor Barra, it could be deja vu. All, all over, over again. again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank so, you, sir. Happy thank to offer you. an amendment if it makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Delegate. Are there any other questions for the sponsor? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the hearing on um, House Bill six, uh, 767. Um, and we will go to House Bill 5, Delegate Krim, uh, State Government, State and Local Government Employees and Contractors, Cybersecurity Training, uh, Delegate Krim uh, regrets that she could not be here, but she appointed an excellent substitute in Delegate Kerr. So Delegate Kerr, if you would present House Bill 5, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Good afternoon, members of the Health and Government Operations Committee. I'm Delegate Ken Kerr here presenting House Bill 5, State and Local Government Employees and Contractors Cybersecurity Training. You'll recall that on December 4th, the Maryland Department of Health experienced a service disruption as a result of a network security incident. The MDH website statement on this incident hasn't been updated since February 13th when they posted, quote, while the investigation is ongoing and is occurring on a parallel track with our restoration efforts, MDH can confirm that the incident was the result of a ransomware attack. And that's the end of the statement. We still don't know the source of the attack, the full extent of the damage or the status of restoration efforts. The attack affected local county health departments and prevented updating of pandemic data during the Omicron variant spike. This incident still ongoing demonstrates the need for cybersecurity awareness training for all Maryland departments and agencies, as well as any contractors accessing the state secure portal. House Bill 5 specifies that beginning October 1, 2023, each state and local employee must complete a certified cybersecurity training if that employee's job duties include accessing a state or local government computer system or database. The Maryland Cybersecurity Coordinating Council must ensure that each employee completes cybersecurity training at least four times each year. A governmental unit may require other employees to complete cybersecurity training um, as well under, under specified conditions. Um, the other witnesses signed up are all favorable with amendments. And as I'm sitting in for Delegate Krim, we may just want to go to them at this point. And on, be on behalf of Delegate Krim, I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Delegate, and thank you for stepping in uh, for um, Delegate Krim. So uh, on your recommendation, I will go to Bryson Poppin. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Bryson Popham. I'm appearing today on behalf of T. Rowe Price, which is a name that I hope is familiar to the members of the committee. It is a worldwide financial services company that does, among other things, it administers our state 529 plan. Cybersecurity is a subject of constant interest to uh, my client. Uh, therefore, this bill uh, is uh, uh, quite interesting to them and they would come within the uh, purview of the bill. Um, we are supporting the bill with an amendment, but I'm in the unusual position of perhaps being offer, perhaps being able to offer removal of the amendment. And for this reason, uh, I don't believe uh, with all due respect that any entity has a more robust cybersecurity training program than my client. And in our past conversations, we have uh, discussed the ability of the state to approve their, that is TRO's uh, cybersecurity training to as long as it meets the requirements uh, of uh, Maryland. Uh, the way we read this bill, uh, it might do that. There is no specific direction in the bill on whether a contractor may present its own cybersecurity training program for approval. The amendment that is attached to my written testimony would do that. Uh, I'd be happy to remove that amendment or withdraw that amendment if we can get a written assurance from the Department of Information Technology or some other official saying, yes, uh, we believe we have the authority uh, to consider a contractor's training program uh, and see if it meets our state requirements. So uh, while I am offering the amendment, Madam Chair, uh, I'm happy to withdraw it under the uh, right circumstances. And with that, we'd respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you, Mr. Popham. Um, I'd like to call Mark Kather, please. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to share our thoughts on House Bill 5. We are asking for a favorable report with the from the committee with amendments. My name is Mark Kather and I'm the interim chief information security and privacy officer for the University System of Maryland. Uh, the USM wholeheartedly agrees that cybersecurity education and training are an essential part of securing any organization. Given the number of threats in the world, it's not possible to secure our environments without training our workforce. That said, the training and education needed by the USM workforce is different than the training and education necessary for workers in the executive branch. 
In the USM, we need our workers to be trained on handling education data under the Federal Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, known as FERPA, research data, financial aid data, and several other types of data that are not found broadly across the executive branch of the government. We really need our training to be in the context of the education environment. On the other side, we believe the executive branch operates much more like a business enterprise and needs training that is more appropriate for their environment. Another point we is that we are already required under existing provisions in the Maryland Code to have cybersecurity policies that are functionally compatible with the state of Maryland security policies, and that includes cybersecurity education and training. Also, House Bill 1122 from the 2020 legislative session already requires that the USM have a robust security policy, and that bill will go into effect in 2024. Lastly, our cybersecurity training and education efforts are regularly reviewed by the Maryland Office of Legislative Audits and the USM Office of Internal Audits. So with all this in mind, we are supportive of House Bill 5, but request an amendment that exempts the University System of Maryland from this bill. Our training needs are different from the needs of the executive branch. We have existing requirements for security and compatibility within the Maryland Code, and we have existing oversight by the Office of Legislative Audits and our own internal auditors. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Kay. Um, I understand that Carol Smith is not present. Is that true? Carol Smith. That's um, Delegate Crim's legislative aide. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, she was there as an emergency if I was unable okay. to do this. I'd also like to point out that the Delegate Crim's written testimony is in everyone's floor system. Thank you, Delegate. Um, and Michael Eismeyer is also was not able to be here, also from OMS. Okay, um, just wanted to make sure. Now, um, Delegate Kerr, are you prepared to take questions on behalf of Doc, uh, Delegate Krim? Uh, no, ma'am, I am not. Okay, so if the committee has questions, we're gonna be directing them to Mr. Popham or Mr. Kather. Any questions from the committee? Um, I have a question for either of you, but only one. Um, it, uh, and I think it's going to go to Bryson. So the training that Tiro has, um, would that is that something that um, the the state could use as a model, as a template, as something that could support the work that um, the state is trying to do and be adapted according to the needs of the different agencies? Because I heard what you said, Mr. Kather, and I think that's really important. I have discussed uh, many aspects of this issue with my client, Madam Chair, but not that one. I'm happy to convey that question to them and get back to you with a response. If, if the state were interested, in, I, I'm always uh, interested in using a, existing wheels. Is this kind of, a, <laughs> kind of a best practices type of question? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, seeing no other questions, then that completes the hearing on House Bill 5. Thank you. Um, for your testimony today, and we'll move to House Bill 594. This is Delegate Fisher, um, State Government, Maryland Reparations Commission, Establishment, Establishment. Uh, it's the Harriet Tubman Community Investment Act. Delegate Fisher, welcome back to HGO. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, can I, should I, oh, we're starting. Um, good afternoon, um, the illustrious Health and Government Operations Committee. Thank you to um, Chair Pendergrass and Vice Chair Peggy Malik and impromptu Chair uh, Cullison for today. My name is Delegate Winika Fisher um, from the District 47 in Prince George's County. I wanted to start my testimony um, with a quote. 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of racist housing policy. Until we reckon with our compounding moral debts, America will never be whole, Tanishi Coates. And I also would say, Maryland will never be whole. The United States has a long history of addressing groups that have been wronged. Communities such as the Jap Japanese Americans, Native Americans, Jewish Americans, and others have had ground to take government action. But somehow the concept of reparations to African Americans or black people or those of the African diaspora have been forcibly removed from their homes and into bondage is still controversial. The talk of, topic of reparations or restitution can take many forms and have different conversations. I come to this committee again this year to ask the state of Maryland to address its original moral wrong of our state and nation. 
In Maryland, the first presence of slaves was in 1639 and was codified in Maryland in 1664. Back then in 1638, the Colony Council in Maryland, which was basically us, created the Maryland Doctrine of Exclusion, which stated neither the existing Black population, their descendants, or any other Blacks shall be permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society. Our state is abolished mm. slavery in 1864, which means Africans and descendants of African um, slaves were in chains of slavery in our state for over 200 years. I think it's important that we continue um, to work to justice and equality. And a part of that is recognizing the moral ill of slavery and figuring out a way for our state to move forward. The legislation in first is its first step um, recognizes the wrongs of slavery and creates a commission filled with many different um, there are many different stakeholders to go over and execute the concept of reparations here in Maryland. This legislation will allow us to not only move forward, but to find real ways in order to make a wrong right. There are many stats on the disproportional outcomes from Pew Research Studies, and one that I will point out to this committee today. Black families, regardless of incomes, are significantly less wealthy than white families. Pew Research Study estimates that white, white households are worth roughly 20 times as much as black households, whereas only 15% um, of white households have zero or negative wealth to more than a third of black African Americans do. Effectively, the black family in America is working without a safety net. The financial calamity strikes, whether it's a medical emergency, divorce, or job loss, is fallen. Reparations would address the missing generational wealth gap and fair opportunities that are not were afforded to descendants of slaves. As I sit here in my office, you can see behind me, kind of glared though, there are two pictures of two great Marylanders, Harriet Tubman, in which this bill is named after, and Frederick Douglass both who were born into slavery. And there are those in your committee right now next to you who are descendants of slaves. It's important that Maryland moves forward like so many others. Many of you have, may have heard of the town of Easton, Illinois that already passed reparations um, two years ago that are addressing these issues and a federal bill, HB 40, to go forward. I hope that this committee would find it um, a worthy cause to actually pass this legislation and work on a commission to address these. I also wanted to mention before I wrap up the health outcomes of, of racism. There are many things that this committee uh, faces every day in the bills that you hear, and a lot of them set, stem from systemic racism and institutional oppression. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I hope you consider passing and move favorable, moving favorable HB 594, Maryland Reparations Commission, the Harriet Tubman Community Investment Act. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, I'm going to call your uh, the first member of your panel, Chris Apple, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm actually not a member of the sponsors panel, but I am happy to share my thoughts. Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, I am Chris Apple. I'm a resident of Columbia, Maryland. Uh, decades of Maryland Courts of Appeals decisions upheld the system of slavery in our state. Decades of laws passed by the General Assembly permitted brutal corporal punishment and perpetuated a system of torture and exploitation where black families were generationally robbed of their wealth. The wealth generated by those enslaved persons was taxed, filling the Maryland treasury with money stolen from black labor. That money built the state house. Legislators were paid with it. And when slavery was finally outlawed in 1864, no attempt was made to compensate those freed people for the centuries of theft and abuse they had endured. Maryland does not accumulate debt the way a person does. If this body issued a 100-year municipal bond, none of the legislators who issued that debt would be alive when it matured, but Maryland would still be on the hook for paying its creditors. The same is true of moral debt. Though no one alive today is directly responsible for those atrocities, Maryland itself is still responsible. Maryland is home to world-class sociologists, archivists, economists, and historians who are perfectly capable of figuring out who is entitled to compensation. This task is entirely feasible so long as we have the courage to undertake it. Until then, some Marylanders will just have to accept the fact that their family prosperity was plundered and they are not entitled to the fruits of that labor, even though their neighbors are. 
Real justice on this issue is so rare that most people don't know what it looks like. But this committee could show us what that looks like. I respectfully urge a favorable report. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Apple. Um, Rashawn Ray, please go ahead. I'm honored to testify in support of House Bill 594 for the Harriet Tubman Community Investment Act. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a professor of sociology at the University of Maryland in College Park, where I'm the executive director of the Lab for Applied Social Science Research. In addition to the economic consequences of slavery to Black Americans, the mental, emotional, and brutal anguish of slavery is something that can never have a price tag placed upon it. Still, reparations are a good step forward to reconcile the healing. The legacy of slavery in the state of Maryland is noteworthy. From 1619 to 1697, nearly 100,000 Black people arrived in Maryland. By 1776, 90% of them were native born. And in the mid 1800s, Maryland slave owners sold 20,000 enslaved Black people further south. One in three marriages were split and one in five children were separated from their parents. More broadly, Blacks were promised 40 acres and a mule to atone for slavery. This form of reparations never precipitated. However, reparations did manifest for other groups, including Native Americans, Japanese Americans, Jewish Americans, and even slave owners themselves, like in Washington, DC. Black Americans are the only group that have not received reparations for state sanctioned racial discrimination, while slavery afforded some other families the ability to accrue wealth multiple times over. Some broad stats are Susanna, stop the clock, please. Uh, um, Mr. Ray, your 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 signal is is three dollars by value Mr. Ray, Mr. Ray, your your according aspects to get. Yes, can, can you hear me? Am I back? Uh, you you're back no? now. Yes, we, we lost about the last uh, 20 seconds or so. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So the point that I was making is that in 1860, $3 billion was the value as assigned to enslaved Black people. And in 1861, $250 million was the value placed on cotton that enslaved Black people picked. The Harriet Tubman Community Investment Act is important because it's comprehensive. It focuses on education in terms of tuition, as well as uh, student debt. Second, it provides down payments, grants for, for housing, and also housing, housing revitalization. And then thirdly, it provides business grants. Collectively, this proposal is about restoring value to people and restoring value to places. If only one portion is addressed, then the other important aspects of how systemic racism operates continues to manifest. Finally, this is about repaying a debt and implementing restitution. The time to do what's right is now to finally properly address America's original sin that continues to stain our country. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Dr. Ray, I appreciate it. Um, are there questions for the sponsor or, uh, or her panel? Questions from the committee? Um, Delegate Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just wanted to um, ask the sponsor um, a clarifying question because I think maybe you you misspoke a little bit when you were talking about something. Um, oh yes, thank sorry. you, <laughs> thank you, Delegate Kelly. I misspoke the name of the town um, in Illinois that passed reparations recently. It's um, Evanston. I think I said Evanston. I'm really sorry. So for those committee members who might be looking it up, it's Evanston, E V A N. So um, I really appreciate it, and you can find a lot of that information in your written testimony. Thank you so much, Delegate. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Uh, are there any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate, for bringing us this bill. And thank you, panelists, for being here to uh, present your testimony. That concludes the hearing on uh, 594. We will move to House Bill 723, Delegate Charles, State Finance and Procurement, Procedures and Pricing and Selection Committee for Preferred Providers. Delegate Charles regrets that he cannot be here today, but he has sent um, his able uh, substitute, Ms. Becca Rhodes. Becca, I'm going to turn it over to you.
Awesome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairwoman, Vice Chair, and Honorable Members of the Health and Government Operations Committee. Uh, for the record, I am Becca Rhodes, uh, Delegate Charles's Chief of Staff, and I'm pleased to testify in support of House Bill 723 on his behalf. Uh, this bill proposes to further streamline and refine the 2017 House Bill 1021 that fully went into effect in 2019. Uh, 1021 substantially reorganized and rendered more efficient Maryland state procurement. Having worked with and applied the changes proposed in House Bill 1021 for almost three years, the provisions proposed in this bill, HB 723, will serve to make state procurement even more streamlined, even more transparent, and more consistent. For the benefit of all citizens, businesses, and state government entities in Maryland, based on desired rec reconciliations that have arisen from the infant program. So House Bill 1021 was introduced in 2017, following the publication of several studies on state procurement published by both the executive and legislative branches. So according to the 2016 executive order establishing the commission to modernize state procurement, the precursor to House Bill 1021, the state of Maryland spent over $4 million, sorry, my bad, $4 billion annually on goods and services, yet the state's procurement system was considered an outdated patchwork of legislative and regulatory fixes. The central purpose for enacting procurement reform in 2017 remains today and includes the need to provide state procurement policies and procedures that are open, transparent, and equitable for all participants. The legislation called for clear, uniform standards and training for state procurement personnel in order to safeguard equal treatment of bidders and to increase competition. Among the many and more significant changes made then through the reorganization of state procurement were the establishment of a chief procurement officer to control and oversee specified state procurement activities, the transfer of procurement control and oversight responsibility and authority to the Department of General Services from the Department of Budget and Management, and information technology and public safety and corrections capital construction. While the specifics of each element of this bill are far too numerous and technical to address in this testimony, they include many more examples. This bill will rename the Pricing and Selection Committee to oversee pricing for all three preferred providers, including Maryland's Correctional Enterprises, as well as Blind Industries and Services of Maryland and Maryland Works. Bringing all three into the same process will reduce the number of steps needed currently and will offer greater oversight and transparency in pricing and awards. Procurement has been removed from the definition of development within the Department of Information Technology and has been moved over to the Department of General Services as to control the agency. And this was done in House Bill 1021. So these are just further refinements that will ensure greater consistency, transparency, accountability, and a more centralized procurement authority at the Department of General Services. So the provisions proposed will ensure that all the procurements of supplies and services adhere to defined procedures for posting solicitation and awards for the um, for Emma, the E Maryland Marketplace. So overall, we just really want to promote transparency in the procurement process, clarify the language and ensure consistent consistency throughout the statute, streamline the process of pricing and procurement for preferred providers, and enhance controls and clarity over procurement operating revenues and, expense, and expenses. So we have a couple people from the Department of General Services here to speak further about the bill. Um, but again, this is, this is a compliment to HB 1021 in 2019. So we wanna pass this just because we wanna make sure that we are continuing, continuing to promote transparency and accountability. So thank you so much. We urge a favorable report. Thank you very much, Ms. Rhodes, for filling in for the delegate. Yeah, of course. Um, I would like to call Michael Zimmerman. Good afternoon. My name for the record is Michael Zimmerman. I am the Chief Procurement Officer for the Department of General Services, Office of State Procurement. Happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Okay, thank you. That's good testimony. Um, and I'll call on Jamie um, Thomas Tomzuski. That works. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sorry. You know, no, that's okay. Good afternoon. Jamie Tomaszewski. I am the Chief Administrative Officer for the Office of State Procurement in the Department of General Services. And I too, uh, with uh, Michael Zimmerman, are here to answer any questions that anyone has about the uh, changes in the bill. Thank you very much for being here. Are there questions from the committee on House Bill 723? Uh, Delegate Salerga. There. Um, so I guess this would be for Mike. I'm assuming that you're supporting it and you helped craft this, that the you know, DGS has come alongside to make these fixes. Thank you for the question, Delegate Slega. Um, no, actually, um, I, absolutely, we support this bill and, and would really do want a favorable report. Um, I was not here when the bill was actually crafted. I was the Chief Procurement Officer at MDOT during that period of time. Uh, I recently took this job in, in the end of December, um, but I have been heavily involved in it since that period of time and, and support it wholeheartedly, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Krebs. I had the same question, but I'm assuming that the two of you that are here for under oral support Ellen Robertson's um, written testimony as, as was presented, is that accurate? Yes, it is. Okay, thank we appreciate it. Just make it clear that you're all in support of this written testimony. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Delvin. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, then we that concludes the hearing on House Bill 723. I thank Ms. Rhodes and the folks from DGS to, for bringing that bill to us. And we go to House Bill 516. Uh, sponsored by St. Mary's County Delegation. This is St. Mary's County Humane or Human Relations Commission Equal Treatment. And um, Mr. Hauser, are you presenting the bill today? No, that's me, yeah. Delegate okay. Calls. Oh, okay, Delegate Morgan. Hey, um, hey, good to see everyone, uh, just like every day. <laughs> HGL, I got. <laughs> Hopefully the simplest and quickest bill of the session. Uh, what we're doing here in St. Mary's County is updating our existing duties to our health and uh, relations commission and matching it with the fe federal def definition to include sexual orientation and gender identity. This is a bill that we passed through our committee last year and was voted unanimously in the house and it got tied up in the Senate. And uh, include my testimony. Uh, Mr. Hauser's here on behalf of the county as the county attorney. We're happy to answer anybody's questions. Thank you, Delegate. Mr. Hauser? Um, first off, good afternoon to the committee. Thank you for giving us the time and the consideration. And thank you on behalf of the county commissioners, Delegate Morgan, for presenting the bill and for the delegation as a whole for bringing it forward. Uh, I share Delegate Morgan's hope. This will be a quick, non-controversial bill that we can handle with dispatch. It's um not much we're asking for on this one just sharpening some of the language in our mission statement and our enabling statute for our human relations commission and then adding a uh, language to bring us up to par with federal uh, civil rights law after the bostock v clayton county decision in 2020 we've um i'll just take you all through the changes they're not too too bad uh paragraph one of 29106 b1 uh, right now, the commission's charge is to use its influence and persuasion to direct the efforts of the community to solving problems that are many times are the basic reasons for racial tensions. We are requesting that be changed to are the basic reasons for tensions, just plain tensions, but adding the words within the community. And then our second paragraph, we are adding sexual orientation, and gender identity to the list of protected classes that the Human Relations Commission is to encourage and ensure equal treatment of. And we are striking the word uh, to do all this in compliance with federal, state, and local laws, and instead asking that that word compliance be changed to in accordance with. And then we are also adding the words at the very end of that paragraph um, 
for all state and local laws and regulations related to. The present reading of it is housing, employment, and public accommodations. We're requesting that language be changed to related to discrimination in housing, education, employment, and public accommodations. I think that uh, wraps up the explanation of the bill. And okay. thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hauser. So I do see some questions for um, the sponsor and uh, Mr. Hauser. Uh, Chairman Pendergrass. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a very technical question. I do not have in the file a letter of support from the delegation. I'm sure that oh, really? you had intended to send it, but just get it to us, please. Thank you. I can get that to you because I have a physical copy right here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. He has he has the copy we need. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Delegate. Um, Delegate Rosenberg. You may have said this already, but is this the same bill as last year's bill? It, honestly, it is a little different. Um, I think last year's bill, we, we grouped everyone, um, equal treatment of everyone. I don't think we spelled it out like we did. This This definition that's in this language here matches the federal law. Uh, we had some problems over in the Senate um, in regards to what we had last year. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on HB 516. Uh, thank you to the sponsor and Mr. Hauser for bringing us the bill. We'll move to another St. Mary's County delegation bill, House Bill 523. Um, this is St. Mary's County newspaper or newspaper in general circulation definition. Is this you, Delegate Morgan? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this bill is going to be a good bit, a little bit more complicated than our last bill. So we're trying to change the definition of what a newspaper is to include free circulation of newspapers. And let me explain why. Um, we're having problems with our county notices. And the first goal to when it the county puts out a legal notice to the public is for the public to be able to read the notices in the paper. So we had the Enterprise newspaper served uh, St. Mary's County for years, like decades upon decades. And then about three years ago, um, maybe from labor shortage, they stopped delivering the newspaper and they started mailing the newspaper locally. So it would come in your mailbox. It was a bi-weekly newspaper. It would get printed up on Wednesdays and Fridays, but often it wouldn't show up until two or three days after that. And people simply just stopped reading it because, well, I mean, it's old news. And then COVID hit. I think it was about July or June of uh, 2020. That paper, the Enterprise paper, I think it was part of the Gazette series, kind of folded up. And now it's with a conglomerate with Amazon. So when they purchased that paper, um, they didn't That's print it for years. maybe um, a month delegate, or so. Delegate, can I ask you to, to hold just a second? Um, sure. Mr. Normandon, could you please mute your computer? Thank you. Delegate, go ahead. So they didn't Sorry. mail this newspaper for like a month or so. And then when they came back out and reestablished it, it came out as the Southern Maryland newspaper. So what this is, is all three counties in Southern Maryland, Charles, St. Mary's, and Calvert, and it's mailed, uh, or and it is mailed, and it's printed once a week down there, um, which is good, but the problem is a lot of people stop subscribing to it, and not many people read it. We have another local newspaper in St. Mary's called St. Mary's County Times. And this is pretty much what we would consider the local paper. You look through it, it's got sports, it's got politics, it deals with the base and stuff. The problem with this newspaper is it's free. They use a different sales model where they sell a lot of advertising, like for the grocery store chains down there and stuff. So that's the problem. The county would like to be able to put legal notices in both the regular newspaper that we've always had, plus a free circulated newspaper um, that's more readily available so people would see it. Now, I know there's some opposition testimony um, that are you know, really concerned about this, but I think it's uh, a lot of profit motives uh, behind that. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to um, the county attorney if, if he wanted to weigh in at all, um, Mr. Mr. Hauser. Certainly, Mr. Hauser. Um, so again, thank you to the committee for considering this legislation. Thank you again to Delegate Morgan for presenting it and to our delegation for bringing it forward. Uh, as Delegate Morgan so aptly summarized, the county commissioners are requesting that an exception be made for Maryland General Provisions 1-113 A's definition of a newspaper of general circulation to include for St. Mary's County and for St. Mary's County only a um, exception that so long as every other plank of the definition of a newspaper of general circulation provided by the base law is satisfied that a newspaper will not be kept from being considered a newspaper of general circulation if it's provided for free. Uh, as Mr. Moore, uh, Delegate Morgan stated, we have one paper, one local paper of record in the county right now. And that was formerly the Enterprise, which now um, is conglomerated with the other local papers from our neighboring counties in Charles and Calder and no longer carries only St. Mary's County news and is no longer targeting only St. Mary's County residents. We believe there'd be only one other paper in St. Mary's County that fits the def requirements of 1-113A that is free. Mr. Moore, Delegate Morgan did identify that as the County Times. It's a paper that runs weekly. It habitually contains news items, reports of current events, editorial comments, advertising matter, and other information of general public interest. It has a total circulation of 9,500 printed copies per week and is distributed at 175 locations throughout St. Mary's County. The other thing I will state that, um, why else it matters besides just giving us one more tool in the toolbox is looking at it. One concern I had are advertising rates. Southern Maryland News charges $11 per column inch. County Times charges $10 per column inch, which would save the commissioners and citizens who have to publish legal notices some uh, payment. And there's my two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hauser. Um, are there questions for the sponsor or um, his panelist? Any questions? Okay, um, seeing none, we'll move to the unfavorable panel and we'll begin with Mr. Jim Normandin. Mr. Normandin. I'm sorry, Madam Secretary. Thank you very much for your patience. Yes, I, okay. I appreciate that very much. Um, I um, welcome um, the opposition. I think um, we have been down this road already once uh, before. Again, my name is Jim Normandin. I'm president of APG Media uh, of Chesapeake LLC. We uh, publish a number of newspapers throughout the state of Maryland mostly local rural newspapers. I'm testifying today to oppose H. Bill 523, brought forth by St. Mary's County. My reason for this opposition stands strongly on the foundation of reliability, accessibility, verifiability, proactive standard procedures, and transparency. <laughs> the enterprise still today um, circulates and is a paid circulation newspaper. It currently has 9,312 9, uh, 9, adults read that newspaper each week. It is it abides by a law, a uh, government, uh, you, I'm, I apologize, the U United States Postal Services uh, Postal Permit, which governs how we go about our business. It provides an audit trail. We provide a top-notch website, which last year alone um, had 91, uh, last October had 91,212 visitors registered in 200,941 page views. We continuously serve this community. We watch our community. We hire journalists. Um, we are a paid subscriber paper and we shine sun so there is no secrecy to what happens with public notices. We oppose this bill. Thank you, Mr. Normandon. Uh, Rebecca Snyder, please. 
Good afternoon, committee. My name is Rebecca Schneider. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Delaware DC Press Association. We are here in opposition to House Bill 523. Now, uh, Delegate Morgan talked a little bit about public notice. I just want to clarify, and it's in your packet, um, best practices in public notice include that the notice is independent, accessible, verifiable, has a, a large audience and is presented in the context of news and information um, within the community. And so the whole goal of public notice is to ensure trust in the process. And, uh, and so when we think about public notice and you think about that audience, advertising and public notice is, is advertising in some respects. Advertising is most effective when that audience is verified and quantifiable. And unfortunately, no matter how wonderful the County Times is, it does not have a verifiable audience. Um, it is dropped, I'm sure, in, in uh, areas in which uh, residents can pick it up, but there's no tracking to understand whether or not that um, publication is proactively desired or read. So the current law that we have takes into account the best practices of public notice because it ensures that the audience is verified and quantified. That comes through the second class periodicals permit. So those, um, the requirements of that, that permit uh, mean that no more than 75% of the content is advertising and it has an established list of subscribers or requesters. Um, so that means it's putting guardrails up. So uh, setting aside the county times, this legislation would allow any free publication like a shopper or, or really anything at all to carry notice. And that is not going to help um, with the public's right to know. This bill, I, I'll close and say, this bill would also create an anomaly among uh, jurisdictions in the state that al allows free newspapers. So we encourage to make people to vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, are there questions? I see Delegate Rosenberg. Obviously, we don't do this. I guess this is for okay. Ms. Snyder. Ms. Snyder. Assuming we don't do this in any other jurisdiction, we don't allow this in any other jurisdiction to a free newspaper. Is that correct? As far as I understand, it's only for St. Mary's. Um, however, you can't, under the law, you can't drive to a particular publication. So the County Times obviously is the one that, that Delegate Morgan would like notices to go to, but it doesn't say that a shopper or you know some type of other circulation, uh, other publication that's just out in the world can also carry notice. So I would I would really urge you all to think about the implications of changing this law for the sake of one publication. But I respectively answer this also. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, we get one answer per um, question. Um, Delegate Rosenberg, did you have a follow up? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, Delegate Hill. Uh, thank you. I wanted to ask, um, I guess, Mr. Is it Mr. Normandon, who mm -hmm. testified. Um, I'm not clear. Are, are, is your reading of this bill? either impl implicitly or explicitly that if this were passed, the county would then choose the St. Mary Times as the paper of choice and they would stop putting things in the enterprise so that the enterprise, so I mean, because as I read it, there's nothing that stops them from putting things in both. And even now they can continue to put things in the enterprise and also post things in St. Mary's Times. So there's nothing to stop them from doing both. That's absolutely correct. And I'm not here to protect revenue. The revenue is not what we're talking about. What we're here about is to protect the public uh, so they get the freedom of information under the Sunshine Law. And there's transparency uh, and there's a process of which there's an audit trail of how this all happens. Free newspapers do not have that. And, and um, uh, Delegate Hill, you are correct. They can run them in both. However, it's not a legal notice until it meets uh, general provisions 1113. May I have a follow-up, Madam Chair? Yes. S so that I'm clear, because this is a local bill um, and I 
definitely don't want to get in the way of it. Um, is there uh, any reason that the enterprise to meet this issue of, you know, costs could not offer public notices for free so that it would remove the issue of whether the, the county is paying and where they could get them for free? Well, we currently offer uh, free readership on our website for- no, I mean the notices. Do you charge the county for posting the notices? We do. As can we you, do- can you, Could you charge them nothing or do it for free? Well, since... we, we have to deliver that audience. So if, if, um, if we needed to, um, if that would suffice the bill, um, it does not, uh, it does, it would be unfair to all of the other counties around the state that pay for their advertising. We employ over 200 people. We print 18 newspapers. Um, we have an extensive production facility. We pay taxes in all the counties we live in. We would expect to be remunerated uh, for those services. Our rates, to answer the rate question, um, is we are substantially less than the other daily newspapers that circulate within that marketplace, such as the Baltimore Sun or the Washington Post, and they don't have the circulation that we do. So I don't propose you get rid of the bill. That is not what this is about. This is really about making sure there is a true process that is governed or regulated to make sure that we have transparency within St. Mary's County as a commissioner's run county. And as we know, there's charter counties, there's, there's five different uh, diversions of, um, of counties. And this one happens to be a commissioner county. Thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, Delegate Krebs. I'm just trying to understand, I'm trying to really understand the opposition. So right now you would still have the ability and they would still be sending you their advertisements but you just don't want the people that are doing it for free to be able to have that ability to do it. I'm still trying to figure out if you're not being excluded, am I right? Why would I still don't understand the opposition? So if, if I could take that, um, the issue is that it's the publication that is free. It's not the cost of the advertising that's free. Delegate Morgan said that the, the proposed rate for uh, the County Times, I think was $11 an inch versus the, uh, the enterprise is $12 an inch. The issue is when you run your public notice in free papers, you don't have a verified circulation. You don't really know where those are going. You know, there's nothing to say that that's, I don't know about you, but during the pandemic, I wasn't going anywhere really. I wasn't picking up a free paper in a news, in, a, in the supermarket or anything like that. I was still getting my home delivery of various publications, whether it be through the mail or through carrier deliver, delivery. But there's no way just because you print 20,000 copies or however many copies that you know where they're going if they're a free publication. It, with, a, with a publication like the Enterprise, a publication that carries a periodicals permit, you were required to have a subscriber list. You were required to have a list of requesters that say, yes, I want that publication. Does that help explain it? It, it does only because it just, I, I can't understand why giving more information out more, even if it only goes to two people, why that's a bad thing if you're still publishing it. I just, or if somebody put it out on the internet, why getting that out to those people, why that would be a harmful. I, I'll, I'll try to understand it better, but th thank oh. you. And, for sure, you, more notice is better. We're, we're never saying that, but I think what, um, what Delegate Morgan was intimating is that the county would move its notices to this free publication. It wouldn't be in addition to what they're already doing. It would be away from, from their current paper of record and in, into a free publication, which is like throwing that notice into the abyss. No, I didn't understand it that way. way. I, I didn't understand it. Way. Okay. okay, thank you. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Delegate, and we'll move to Delegate Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Normandy, you, you stated how much circulation did you say that your paper had in uh, Southern Maryland? So right now, our readers are 9,312. We service, we pay, uh, we deliver 
not only by mail, but by home delivery, 4,048 copies. And then we have single copy sales. But that's across the whole entire Southern Maryland region, correct? That's not in no, just St. Mary's. No, no, sir. No, sir. Our total circulation for all of Southern Maryland is 17,000. Okay. There's... And that is printed in the October newspaper, okay, uh, and required by our ownership statement. All right. I have well, it right here in front of me if you'd like to see it. I understand, but there's about 360,000 people in Southern Maryland. So, uh, not adults. You. Not all adults, sir. Not all reading adults. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, this question is probably for Delegate Morgan. Um, how, how many free publications are there? Do you know floating around uh, St. I, I Mary County? I couldn't answer that question, uh, Delegate, off the top of my head. I mean, there are free publications like um, real estate magazines and stuff like the Penny Saver and, and periodicals that you'll see at the supermarket. But there's really only uh, currently, I mean, there used to be multiple newspapers, for, but really there's basically only two newspapers that, that service the region, and that is the Southern Maryland Combined newspaper, and then the County Times newspaper that's printed up once a week. I get a the follow printed up once a week. Can I get a follow up, Madam Chair? Yes. So with this bill, would the public know where to go look for <laughs> the publication? So I, I was wanting to make sure there weren't a bunch of free publications out there and the public really wouldn't know where to specifically go look for publications. Well, there's already some, there's majority more local news in our free paper that we're, we're trying to qualify to be able to put public notices in. But as the county attorney stated, I mean, it has over 9,000 circulars per week here and our county has about 113,000 people. So that's a more more reach than we currently have. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Rosenberg. Question for the sponsor. Would, would the bill allow the county to circulate, or excuse me, to publish in only one newspaper? John, you wanna take that? I think it's a either or. If I may, it um so it wouldn't require only one paper. We'd still have the option of the County Times or the Enterprise. But um, as I stated in my testimony, our thinking and our reading what the actual qualifications, uh, what the enumerated qualities of a newspaper general circulation are in 1-113A2 is that the County Times is the only free paper that satisfies those definitions. Um, and in particular, I think to zone in on the words at the very end of 113A2, which are that they have to be news items, reports of current events, editorial comments, advertising matter, and other miscellaneous information that is of public interest and is found generally in an ordinary newspaper, honing in on ordinary newspaper. I think as a practical matter, if someone came to say our clerk of the court or our register of wills, showing that they had run an ad in a penny saver or in a specialty magazine, I think the response of our court officials, and I have had the discussion with the Register of Wills, would simply be to refuse that and say that you have to publish in a paper of actual general circulation. And if they want to insist that their paper satisfies the new definition, they can take the county to court over it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Delegate. And Delegate Kipke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just a quick question for Delegate Morgan. The uh, free newspaper, it sounds like your opposition is saying that they have a verified list of subscribers. Um, I'm curious if the free newspaper has provided you with uh, a verified um, list of distribution. I understand that uh, from their perspective, if they just dump a bunch of newspapers at the front of a grocery store or some other places, but if they actually have a regular distribution list, they're mailing this out to homes. Um, I'm just curious, are they just placing them around at the front corner uh, of stores for people to pick up on their way out? Or are they actually mailing them to people's homes? They're not, presently they're not mailed. Uh, I believe they're at 173 different locations around the county. 
Okay. Um, I mean, I picked this one up right outside the, uh, my post office box where my campaign mail goes. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any uh, oh, delegate Pandari? Delegate, you're on mute. Here we go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Still, I'm trying to understand this bill. This is uh, this question is to um, sponsor of the bill. How does the this bill um, promote uh, or support the principle of transparency and open government here? Well, as thank you, Delegate, for the question. As it starts off a transparency, more people would see the ad. That's the reason why we're we're doing this bill to, to start with, is that because of the circulation has been reduced into the paper that we normally would put legal notices in. The only thing is reason why this pa paper qualifies for putting legal notices in, and this paper does not qualify for putting legal notices is is because this paper is paid for. That's it. That that's the legal. That's that's the difference there. So basically, we just want people to see the legal notices that we're we're, we're publishing. Um, that's that's the point of the bill. I think it's for open and more transparent government. Thank you. Thank you, delegate and delegate Bagnell. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I apologize if this has been asked. I lost my signal for a moment. Um, but just just to clarify, um, the the free publication that um, that is is seeking this doesn't have any sort of subscriber list. They they don't have like an online. We they can get an email. It's it's purely um, drop sites. Is that correct? No, no, that's not correct. So it's the county asking for this. This new newspaper didn't ask for the bill. Didn't ask for us to put the bill in. Um, we're just trying to get public notices out. But yes, the, the the County Times, which is the free newspaper that we're talking about, and that's why they're disqualified from us putting um, their uh, legal notices in, does have a website and you can download their papers and, and look at the entire paper uh, via PDF. And they have a Facebook page as well. Quick follow-up. Yes. Um, uh, but, but they don't, but they don't have a, a a current distribution list um, of, they, of they, subscribers. They, Is that correct? That's correct. They do not have a subscriber list because they do not charge for the paper, but it's okay. more generally circulated than the paid newspaper. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, Chairman, you, your question was answered? Okay. All right. <laughs> Seeing... No other questions. That completes the hearing on House Bill 523. And at this time, the committee is going to take a 15 minute break. Um, and we will reconvene at 345. So we'll see you back here at 345.
Okay. We are going to begin resume the hearing in 30 seconds. So I give folks a second. Thank you for indulgence and letting the committee stand up and walk around for a minute before we proceeded with the rest of the hearings. Okay, we are going to start with House Bill 581. This is Delegate Patrick Young, Public Safety, Fire, Rescue, or Emergency Medical Services Entities Peer Support Program. Delegate Young, welcome back to HGO. Thank you, Madam Chair. Happy to be here. Uh, one, uh, proud to be in front of you again today, and I'm also honored to be presenting to you HB. 581, Public Safety, Fire Rescue, and Emergency Medical Services Entities Peer Support Programs. <clears throat> so our firefighters and EMS workers are heroes. That's a fact. Uh, they're the ones that run towards danger to protect our homes, our loved ones, and our lives. Our collective admiration for these men and women is well-deserved. And when we think of the acts and the actions and the job that they do, we think of bravery. We think of the action of being brave or the examples that have been shown day in and day out of what they have to face in order to keep all of us safe. Uh, but we often forget that bravery isn't simply defined as a physical act of doing something brave. Rather, it's the internal act of overcoming one's fear in order to do what must be done, to do what others can't do, in order to keep us all safe. And the consequences of overcoming fear time and time again, over and over again, is that we often see that we change. We change to the way in which we interact with the world. We change the way that we perceive and also deal with trauma and also how we deal with stress. And we see this in groups that experience similar, have similar experiences. Um, veterans, police officers, as well as trauma doctors and trauma nurses. Uh, and in that spirit of knowing that we ask so much and so much is given, uh, we know that there are certain things that we can do to make it easier on these folks um, that we have so much admiration for. HB 581 establishes a peer support program for firefighters and EMS workers. And there are three key elements that I wanna point out. One, it's free, there's no cost to it. Two, it's confidential, which is important for anyone that is suffering from trauma or has had an experience that one, if they wanna share and receive help for, may also be concerned about the consequences that it may have on someone's work, um, life or career. And two, it's done by peers, those that know the challenges and traumas of the job that someone faces. Uh, and have been through the same sorts of experiences and have found ways to also cope with those experiences. The state bill in front of you is in line with federal legislation that was recent, recently passed and signed into law by President, uh, President Biden that establishes peer support programs for police officers. This bill would establish and stay in line with those uh, same criteria and that same law, but applying it to firefighters and EMS workers. Uh, it should be noted, that there are exceptions to the confidentiality provision, confidentiality provision uh, that indicates situations where confidentiality, confidentiality is not required, such as when there is a threat of suicide, bodily harm, uh, where there is information related to child abuse, or when there is an admission of, a, of criminal conduct. And those uh, that provision can be found on page two, line 18 through 28. Uh, with that, I will pass it to my panel, if that's okay, Madam Chair, but I thank you for your time and urge a favorable report. Yes, thank you, Delegate. Um, I will turn the mic over to Jeffrey Buttle. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. It's always good to see you, even if virtually. Um, for the again. record, Jeff Buttle, President of the Professional Firefighters of Maryland. Uh, our organization is the statewide affiliate of the International Association of Firefighters and combined we represent over 12,000 active retired fire rescue and emergency, emergency services personnel. The need for mental health resources in the fire rescue and emergency medical profession is on the rise. 
Each and every day, our frontline heroes are exposed to the most unimaginable of circumstances. And over time, this takes a toll on the mental health of our first responders. The IFF in conjunction with IFF local affiliate, affiliates have successfully developed peer support programs around the United States, including here in the state of Maryland. While implementing this, these critical programs, the most common issue we've heard from our members was confidentiality of the process. This legislation would ensure that any member reaching out to a peer support counselor for assistance can do so with the peace of mind that goes along with reaching out for help without fear of reprisal from an employer or the stigma of seeking mental health services, which is immeasurable. Uh, these protections would be solidified in state law uh, and apply equally to all of our fire and rescue EMS personnel across the state of Maryland. Uh, there's also a, a section of this bill that um, deals with developing best, best practices, uh, I think, which will help some of the uh, smaller outlying jurisdictions that don't necessarily uh, have the peer support programs that some of the larger jurisdictions do as well. Uh, as always, we look forward to uh, working with this, uh, working with the committee on this important piece of legislation and uh, uh, strongly uh, support House Bill 581 and hope that we can move this favorable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Grant Walker, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Grant Walker. I'm the first district representative for the Professional Firefighters of Maryland and a vice president for the Prince George's County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics Association. I'm a lieutenant with the Prince George's County Fire and EMS Department. On April 15th, 2016, the members of my local experienced one of their darkest days. Hmm. John Skillet Olmschneider was shot and killed in the line of duty. Our department would see multiple line of duty deaths and multiple off duty deaths in the following years. When Skillet was killed, we saw regional and national peer support resources pour in to help. These resources were the calm in the storm. Unfortunately, those were short term resources. Long after these teams had gone home, the scars of my members' trauma remained. Our local created our peer support team following the death of Skillet, and we have seen it become a critical component in our daily lives. Our peer support team on average has over 400 contacts with our members per year. Some of these contacts can be as simple as needing someone to talk to. Many of these contacts are considerably more serious. What the peer support team actually does is address problems prior to it affecting someone's work product. Too often, sending someone to a counselor in a workplace is looked at as a checkbox in the disciplinary process for workplace behavior. These peer support resources ensure that our behavioral health needs are addressed prior to them manifesting into workplace problems. Unchecked, we've seen these issues lead to reduced productivity, inability to work, and more serious events like DUIs and suicides. We are here today because this critical resource is at risk. The peer support model is hinged on the idea of privacy and trust. The confidentiality is essential to overcoming the stigma of asking for help and the fear of a ruined workplace reputation. For most of my career, we didn't talk about behavioral health. Similar to the military, we have always been told to deal with it. Those days are gone. We have acknowledged that firefighters experience the worst days of their lives day in and day out. We must address the behavioral health impacts of their experience so they can continue to do the work that they love. I ask for this committee for a favorable report on House Bill 581 with the included amendment from the Senate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Walker. Um, we have another individual with uh, favorable with amendment. I'm going to include him now. So if Mr. Black, John Black is available. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me, Madam Chair? Yes, we can. Uh, Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I am uh, the Assistant Chief, Volunteer Assistant Chief of Salisbury Fire Department. I also retired with 52 years of military service, combat veteran, uh, recently retired. Right? It's been, it was five years ago yesterday I retired from the military. I'm speaking before you today because peer support personally helped me. Um, I am diagnosed with PTSD from the military. Um, I had a tragic incident within my department in recent years where uh, I was intimately involved. Because of the peer support team that my department has and the confidentiality that they have, it stopped me from spiraling backwards in my treatment for my PTSD. Without that team there, following the IFF model uh, and with the confidentiality that we have internally, I don't know where I'd be right now, to be honest with you. They've been retired. I just hit my, I'm working on my uh, 40th year service to the state of Maryland as a volunteer and work my way up to the ranks. I'm fifth generation. Um, 
support this bill 100% because I have been directly impacted by these groups. And unless anybody has any more questions for me, then ma'am, that is all I have at this time. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Black, for coming and telling us your story and supporting the bill. Um, that com completes the speakers on the bill. I'll open it up for questions from the committee. Delegate Sam, uh, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this question is for Mr. Black. This is ironic um, that we actually get to see each other face to face <laughs> as you were the individual who ran over my son. Um, yes, can you elaborate a little bit more as to how the department or this bill would have helped you or has helped you? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, as I stated before, I had the uh, I had PTSD already from the military and diagnosed. Um, I've been going through treatment from that since uh, 2007 after my first combat deployment and doing all the, um, going through the recovery process at the Pentagon because I was there following that as attack as well. Um, so without this peer support group there, when I got back that day, I really think I'd probably be retired now and probably be in deep depression because those people were there to follow up with me, to call me consistently, to check on me, as I did with your son, when I could get hold of him, to check on him throughout his whole process, if you were aware of that or not, that that was attempted. Um, and I, I think this bill is prudent because as stated by the other members of the IFF, um, it's not something that you need to uh, just, I went away and not do anything about it. When you have these issues that bother you, you need to reach out and look for this assistance. I don't know if that answers your question, ma'am, or not. It does. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Delegate Bagno. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you to the bill sponsor. I, I know peer-to-peer -peer services for um, you know, first responders is, is so important. Um, but there was there was mention of um, of an, a Senate amendment, and there are two um, amendments in our floor system. Can you speak to uh, if if you are um, amending the bill or if you've accepted an amendment from the Senate? So I have not uh, talked with my Senate co-sponsor or cross file yet about the amendments that they brought up. However, uh, we're in lockstep in terms of uh, conforming the bill so that they. We'll be in uh, we'll be in different postures. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Delegate Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Delegate Young, for this um, excellent bill. Just two parts to the question. Um, I just want to be clear on how this augments what the state critical incident stress management team already does. So, how does this help them to do more? And second of all, I wanted to be sure that PSAP. Uh, specialists, 911 specialists are also included. It's not just in-person frontline workers. Sure, and if it's okay, I can even pass it to Mr. Buttle to talk thank about you. the, if that's so, all right. right. Yeah, sure. So, so, so to, right. thank you, uh, Delegate, for the question. Uh, so uh, critical incident stress management and peer support are two very different things from each other. Uh, the critical inc incident stress management is the uh, initial response uh, that takes care of the initial shock of, a, of an event. Peer support is more uh, of the long-term uh, help that our peers need over a long period of time. I'll give you a good example. Uh, I think uh, probably everybody on this call is familiar with the um, recent uh, triple line of duty death up in Baltimore City of our firefighters that uh, died on the Stricker Street fire. Uh, you know, the initial response was critical incident stress management where peer support comes in is for a long time, our members up there are going to need help to uh, on a long term basis to get through that. And the peer support system is designed so that they have one of their peers who understands the job, understands the profession, understands what they're going through. Uh, and one of the one of the issues that we um, that we've heard from our members is that there's a, there's a certain stigma with going to a mental health professional, psychologist, a psychiatrist, which is why uh, in the fire and rescue service, uh, you know, we developed the peer support program. So you could talk to one of your peers 
And the, the important piece of this is to, uh, when talking with your peer, to a, apply that same level of protection uh, in confidentiality with the certain exceptions that are highlighted in the bill, as you would have um, uh, if you were going to seek you know, professional help. And it's been very, very uh, successful. So the, the CISM and peer support are, are really just two very different things from each other. Uh, and, and I don't think there's um, most of the my home jurisdiction um, uh, uh, is Montgomery County is where my home jurisdiction is. Uh, and, and our at least on the fire rescue side, our, our 911 specialists and operators are firefighters. So um, I, I think there's probably a mix across the state. But it, it, I mean, they're they're all one and the same, at least, yeah. you know, from our viewpoint. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Delegate Bondari. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Delegate Young, for uh, sponsoring this bill, very important bill uh, that increases the standard for peer support uh, through training, uh, while at the time, same time requiring confidentiality. I have a question regarding the confidentiality. Uh, while I was reading, it says, with specified exception, it generally prohibits the disclosure of content of any written or oral communication uh, what could be those specified exceptions and who could be in charge of those personal files? So I, I would say that the ones I mentioned in my testimony related to uh, child abuse, suicide, bodily harm, uh, or actions of, of criminal conduct would make the exception. And, and this, is, I, this is pretty much standard when it comes to uh, counseling, peer support, uh, uh, and what I've experienced too at a higher ed level too, where folks confide in you, but there are certain things that you must report um, and can't keep confidential. Uh, the other piece, what was the second piece to your question, Elliot? In charge of personal files, you know, that the counseling files, who would be in charge of that? Where those uh, files will be kept? Sure. So, uh, Mr. Butt, I mean, I assume that because these are already happening now, I mean, the, through different agencies. Jeff, but, do you want to take Jeff that, Jeff? Or Grant. Mr. Yeah, Clark. I don't think it's, uh, so peer support is, uh, we don't necessarily keep a file like a psychologist or a psychiatrist would. It's, it's really uh, sitting down just one-on-one -on -one and being able to talk to one of your peers uh, and work through that. There's uh, not necessarily a traditional file that would be kept like it is, like it, there would be if you were going to seek a, a medical professional. Uh, so I don't think that that's, uh, it, it's more just the one-on-one -on -one sitting down with somebody that you work with and being able to to talk through issues. Um, so I don't think that the exceptions, uh, speaking to the exception part, um, they were not only the industry standard on the exceptions, you know, criminal offense, uh, threat of bodily harm to others, threat of bodily harm to yourself, uh, threat of physical, you know, uh, physically harming, you know, a, a structure or something like that. They're consistent with the federal legislation that was just passed uh, about peer support that applies to law enforcement. And uh, they're also the industry standard of even if you were seeking, um, you know, the assistance of a medical professional, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, if you said you were going to harm yourself, if you said you were going to harm others, they have to report that as well. So it was trying to, to mirror the peer support um, confidentiality with the, with the exceptions that are the, um, the industry standard and also what is mirrored under federal, current federal law. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wonderful bill. Thank you, Delegate. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, and that concludes the hearing on House Bill 581. Uh, thank you very much, Delegate, for bringing this and the, and the speakers for testifying today. Thank you. Um, we will move on to House Bill 575, Delegate Cox, Public Safety Emergency Limitations, uh, Consent of the Governed Act. Delegate Cox, welcome to HDO. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, Madam Vice Chair and committee members. Um, House Bill 575 provides a framework for exercising the governor's emergency powers with a reasonable and judicious set of guardrails and oversight that's currently missing in the existing article. Consider that for 400 years of Maryland history, the legislature has never given up its oversight uh, capacity of the executive branch decision-making until uh, this particular statute was passed post 
the statute does not include enough uh, oversight and guardrails by the legislature, as even this, this body has uh, recently uh, determined uh, with certain limited um, measures to provide some oversight with the contract procurement during emergencies. But what this bill does, Madam Chair, is it brings the, the General Assembly into the decision-making process for all emergency decisions. It's specifically as the um, uh, statute stands today, uh, the governor is allowed to pretty much make very broad emergency-based decisions by whatever metrics he deems appropriate or she deems appropriate. Those decisions are made behind closed doors. Indeed, sometimes not only with no accountability or oversight, but without the ability to even seek a Public Information Act request, uh, such as uh, the current uh, administration performed. Um, we need to have members of the legislature uh, have transparency in this process and not be kept in the dark. Uh, HB 575 restores that co-equal governance under Article 8 of the Declaration of Rights of Maryland, which is the supreme law of the, of the land in Maryland. In addition to legislative oversight, the bill provides protection for members of the General Assembly and Judiciary to continue their official functions and duties in an emergency and not be subjected to authoritarian gubernatorial actions. Maryland hasn't seen threats of arrest of the members of the General Assembly from another arm of our state government since uh, the start of the Civil War in 1861 until recently. The lack of constraint in the public safety article with guardrails allowed our governor to threaten action and in many cases uh, and many of our citizens were uh, who were deemed to have disobeyed his, his um, orders were ticketed or even arrested. HB 575 provides protections for our constituents. It removes the ability of the governor to prohibit residents of the free state from assembling, going to work, church, or school, because the people of this free state are full-grown adults capable of making their own risk assessments and capable of not only going to Walmart during an emergency, but also going to church or to go to their business so they can feed their own families. The bill prohibits the government from deciding what medical treatment you must or must not have. Um, those decisions are left to the individual and the doctor. This is a common sense piece of legislation. It restores uh, the overview and limitations that were intended. Uh, for instance, right now, um, there is an unlimited ability by the governor to prolong the emergency as we saw without any oversight of the, of the legislature. And this bill simply says, if you're gonna say 14 days to bend the curve, then by golly, it better be that. And if not, the legislature has, has to uh, authorize that renewal of a state of emergency. That provides that accountability, provides the transparency, and it provides the protections of a constitutional form of government. And I ask and respectfully ask for a favorable report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate. Um, I'd like to call um, Vince McAvoy, please. Uh, thank you so much, Delegate Cox, for bringing this bill, and thank you, committee, for listening to this. As we're looking at previous uh, states of emergency, let's let's go back to O'Malley. The three that I pulled up, they related to snow, they related to hurricane threat, and a and a squall of storms that came through Maryland. That's the understanding that we've had with this. We never ever expected, no citizen could have possibly expected in the United States of America for this to draw on past months, past quarters, and into years. For 300 years, perhaps more, we've not had our churches closed on Easter. That happened. That happened in Maryland. That's wrongful. That's a huge overstep. And so when Delegate Cox's bill iterates these type of things, he's not inventing um, new rights. These are our existing rights, simply iterated. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we had worked on a trust system and this trust system had worked in the state wondrous ways for, for such a long time. And then it was abused. And we must not let that happen again because honestly, it was, it's only after petitions and, and length of time went by that this power was released. We mustn't let that happen again. So many businesses closed down, so many constitutional rights abridged. So I appreciate Dan Cox for bringing this bill and having, stepping with authority, stepping with 
with precedent and constitutional rights to, so that we can protect all of us. Thank you so much, committee for listening. Thank, thank you, Mr. McAvoy. Um, Nelda Fink. Um, hi, I'm Nelda Fink, um, 8372 Norwood Drive, uh, Millersville, Maryland. Um, thank you for letting me speak on this bill uh, that I completely support uh, so that our great state of Maryland, uh, also known as the free state, can return to being the free state even during an emergency. The current legislation as is written today um, is far too broad, general, open-ended, and open to the interpretation of the enforcer, making it totally unconstitutional. I don't know how in God's name this uh, legislation actually got passed in its current form. The constitutional violations have been listed by many co local constitutional experts, but doesn't take a constitutional expert to see that left in the hands of the wrong governor, this plan will lead to the rights of the citizens being violated, stomped on, squashed and suppressed, totally destroying our state. Clearly anyone can see how this has already occurred. We the people created the government. The purpose of government is to protect the rights of the people not to limit the rights. And there are no exceptions to this protection. Never in the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of Maryland does it ever suggest that our protections are guaranteed except in an emergency or except when anything. There are no exceptions. One of the great aspects of this bill that Dan Cox is, or that Delegate Cox is bringing forward is that it will bring some semblance of protections back into the emergency plan, um, giving consent of we the people during the that I know that during 2020, I tried desperately to contact my representatives. I even sent emails to the whole General Assembly. The only answers I got back from all those attempts is out of office. And I know hundreds of others who did the same. So all during 2020 and the majority of 2021, we the people did not have the representation while the governor stomped all over we the people. That doesn't feel like America. That doesn't feel like the free state. That feels like communism. I request a favorable report on this bill but I also want to point out that everyone on this committee swore an oath to uphold and support the Constitution. And because this bill is now before you, you are somewhat obligated to act on it because it absolutely protects the rights of we the people. A favorable report then comp complies with your oath and restores the rights to we the people during an emergency. Thank you. Thank you for, for being here today. Um, I open the, um, to, to the committee for questions, please. Are there questions from the committee? Just a moment, seeing no questions. Um, there are no further speakers and that concludes the hearing on House Bill 575. And we will move to House Bill 701. And this is Delegate Cox, Public Safety, Governor's Health Emergency Powers Repeal. Uh, Delegate Cox. Thank you again, uh, Madam Chair. And I want to, uh, reiterate what I just said moments ago, that for 400 years, uh, our state has been through many emergencies without having the oppressive statutory uh, grant to a single branch of government, such as we have in uh, public safety article section 143A02, health emergency powers of the governor. This particular section is so broad, it gives the governor uh, nearly in undiscriminate, undis indiscriminatory, pardon me, de uh, declaration in power over both a state of emergency as well as its metrics and the power over the, as, even the bodies and property of the people. I don't know that anybody truly um, understood that that is how this would play out in the, in the context of what we've experienced similarly the last two years. In fact, today, Today marks a, a day of rejoicing for so many people in Maryland where governments all through Maryland, uh, local governments are throwing off, uh, belatedly, but throwing off the mandates that have been in place, uh, including uh, the forced masking of our children and our youth for sometimes eight hours a day in the classroom. In other words, um, this section of the public safety article has given the, the governor such unrestricted power to have almost unconditional authority. And as you well know, this legislature has overridden many of the governor's vetoes. And so the legislature's check and, and balance of the power of the executive is necessary, stable, and valuable. Uh, it is absolutely necessary to safety, is absolutely necessary to the freedom and the ability to protect lives. And the governor 
no matter who she or he may be, has no singular authority to declare that their actions are so-called protecting lives. The system of checks and balances protects lives, and that requires a legislative, executive, and judicial branch that must not allow unconditional authority to be retained and contained in one particular branch. That requires, that causes an abuse of power, exactly what our country and our state was founded to prevent. An abuse of power is what's been happening um, the last two years. And because there was no public discussion or debate over the enactments of these executive orders and extension of the states of emergency, the state has suffered and the people of our state have suffered. Maryland's gross domestic product fell $4 billion in the last year and a half, two years, and it has not yet recovered. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, a total of Maryland exports from 2019 uh, through uh, the end of last year dropped 3%. Uh, unemployment, uh, it goes without saying, continues to be a struggle of over 6.1%, bringing real misery to thousands of Marylanders. I invite you to look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics for comparison of Florida's job recovery compared to Maryland's. Florida, which did not enact such draconian lockdowns, has nearly fully recovered of all of its employment and job participation. Indeed, it's booming. I just returned there uh, last night, from there last night, and I can assure you that uh, it does not have the economic or the oppressive uh, problems that we have had here in Maryland. Had the public safety article not given the governor such uh, un uncontrolled and, and uh, blanket authority over the declaration, extension, and timing of an eventual state of emergency, Perhaps this body's influence over the discussion would have kept our productivity up and protected lives and saved thousands of jobs for our constituents. Jobs which give encouragement, jobs which give hope, and jobs which give our children a future. I respectfully ask for a favorable report on HB 701. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate. Um, uh, Vince McAvoy, please. Thank you once again, so, uh, so much again, committee and, and Delegate Cox, thank you so much for bringing this bill. Um, trust was given and, and trust, trust was abused. I think that, that this approach ties this issue up to get looked at in the future without having such broad powers. If they had not been available, would, would they have even been reached for? I don't think so. I don't think that if, if we had had such code where someone could take it to the limit and then not be accountable. This is a, an issue that, that is brought up in the testimony in this bill and previous testimony this year and last. The cost in dollars, somewhat fungible. The cost in human lives happened. It happened. It happened in New York. We're looking at thousands of deaths and in Maryland thousands of deaths from mismanagement and there's no accountability. It's simply too awesome a power in these political days to be to be wielded as such. And so I thank Delegate Cox for bringing the bill. I thank you all for listening. I think this is a balanced approach after what Maryland has been through the worst ever. Not even world wars have been as bad on Maryland as what we've just been through. So I thank you all for listening and for your considered vote in the positive for this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. McAvoy. Um, Nelda Fink? Yes, okay. Um, so Nelda Fink again, 8372 Norwood Drive, Norrisville, Maryland, District 32. We the people created the government to protect our rights, to protect the rights of the people, not to limit our rights. We did not create the government to, to protect us in the, as individuals or to protect our health as individuals. I think this is something that a lot of people misunderstand. Health and safety are not necessarily legal rights. They are conditions and more specifically states of mind that are cre only created by the individual and only achieved through self-governance with faith in God providing overall blanket of safety and wellness. Taking away this right to choose one's health is absolutely an infringement on one's right to choose as well as one's right of religion, which is the First Amendment. That's why this whole section needs to be repealed as, as Delegate Cox uh, suggests. Restoring those rights and doing so will not infringe on others' rights of the we the people. 
I definitely was affected by the infringement of my religious and personal rights during the 2020 mandates directed by the governor in his supposed attempt to provide a safe environment while executing his emergency health management plan. I physically cannot wear face covering as it will exacerbate a severe and deadly health condition. So mandating and taking away a person's ability to choose for the sake of safety does not provide safety <laughs> for all and in fact creates an unsafe environment for some like me. I lost my six figure job as a result as did many others in this state. I, but I still have my life and my health is not deteriorating. Sacrifices I would have had to take had I followed those mandates. So again, I uh, request a favorable uh, approval of this bill as well. And again, I wanna remind everybody that you swore an oath to uphold, your, uh, uphold the constitution and this bill definitely um, upholds uh, people's uh, constitutional rights. And so I, I ask for a favorable uh, report. Thank you, Ms. Bank. Uh, open it up to the committee now for questions. Are there questions from the committee? Delegate Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Chair. And the question is really for uh, Delegate Cox. Delegate Cox, obviously we're all looking in the rear view map now, and I'm sure that we're not the only state that, that feels like um, maybe this type of legislation needs to be put into place. Do you know of any other states that have taken up this type of legislation and if there's any movement on it? Great question. I, I am aware of it. And if you go to the ALEC website, the American Legislative Exchange, um, they have a listing of all the states as well as the, um, uh, the Maryland legislative, uh, I'm, th I'm drawing a blank as to the name, but the one that advises us here in Maryland, generally, they also have a list of states that have taken up similar legis pieces of legislation, some full repeals and some partial repeals. Obviously, the two bills I've presented do both today. And uh, there is action across the, the, the nation. I don't have an exact tally in front of you uh, to give to you today, but we'd certainly be happy to follow up and provide that to you. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Delegate Cox. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate. Delegate Krebs. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for the spirit, which I believe this is uh, brought to us, um, you know, looking back at our constitution, but um, sitting on this health committee, we realized that there were some things that we think were draconian looking back. You said we're talking about looking in the rear view mirror. We had, it, there were also some things that the governor was able to do, obviously in an unprecedented situation that allowed us to better be able to react to the health er, uh, emergency, which were, which gave, it did give the governor unbridled um, um, power to do things, but a lot, some of those things were good things. And we actually um, codified them in law last year with regards to licensing and with, with regards to telehealth and, and different things. I won't get into all that. So there was some good that came out of it, some good policies. The question, I guess, is this is this is a huge, broad issue of many, many things. And I know we, we often put um, commissions and whatever in place to look, how do how can we do this better? I, and I, it seems to me that, uh, I don't know if you'd be willing to have, I think that the legislature should look at this, you know, and, and look back and say, how could we improve the next time based on what we knew, but which things worked for us? Would you be willing to have that? I mean, I think that's the legislature's responsibility to do that on the biggest pandemic we've ever had in our lifetime to not just keep moving forward, but would you be willing to like turn this into a, um, like look at what we did right, look at where we had too much authority and, and, and what should we change going forward in a more comprehensive way um, versus, I mean, I, this is going to have a hard time, you know, getting past, even though you know I, I believe in the spirit of it. But it seems like it, there needs to be a lot more discussion of what worked, what didn't work, and what worked in other states. What, what, what could, how do we improve for possibly a next time? Would you be willing to do something like that? Thank you, delegate, and I absolutely am interested in that. And I think that's the spirit of the legislation. I think if you look at my testimony also last year when we brought this a similar bill forward. Um, that the issue before us is the authority of the legislature and the duty that we have to act just as, just as quickly as the governor. And we, you might recall that um, my friends across the aisle, it, that we both as Republicans and Democrats were somewhat appalled at the surrounding of our legislature with Humvees, as if uh, the Humvees you know, could stop a virus from flying through uh, towards the Capitol. I mean, that was an outrage. And I think it intimidated us from doing our job. We, we very, every single thing that I think that the governor may have uh, touched on that was helpful, such as the extension of uh, notary, for instance, that's one, you know, one, one thing that was good would be the extension of 
the ability to do notaries over Zoom, for instance, so long as you had proper protections. Well, we, we've done that in the legislature now. There's no reason why we couldn't have done that immediately as the issues arose, particularly since we've all been meeting for Zoom for two years anyway. So I think that the issue comes back to the testimony that I presented last year when you have Yale University um, suggesting that temporary uh, dictatorships are necessary in a republic. I presented that testimony from the Yale Law Review article as an example of how appalling that uh, thought that thinking can be. We don't live in a dictatorship and we should never embrace a temporary dictatorship of any kind because the whole reason for constitutions, bills of rights, and uh, all of these protections that we enjoy as citizens of the United States uh, is for the application during all times of emergencies. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a need for it. So, but yes, you're absolutely correct. We need to work on this and make sure it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Um, Delegate Bandari. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this question is to Miss um, Fink. Uh, thank you, Delegate Cox, for the bill. Maryland North Association um, opposed this bill and they say, as we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, many more Marylanders would have lost their lives if the governor had not taken action under a declaration of public health emergency. And this bill poses a serious danger to Marylanders as it would eliminate the ability of the governor to enact safety measures to protect the public during a health emergency. Do you want to comment on that, Ms. Fink? Uh, yes. So um, there's a lot of statistics that show that the people who, uh, many of the people who did in fact uh, die of the supposed COVID uh, disease uh, had, other, um, had other comorbidities as well. And um, I am of the belief that there has not been and has not ever been really a proof that this virus causes the disease in the first place. And there has also been a lot of evidence showing that the um, uh, number of deaths has been manipulated uh, to, to prove that there or to, to basically uh, uh, support the narrative of a, of a, um, a pandemic. So um, if, you know, that's where this bill and the 575 bill, putting those two together and having other task forces and other committees involved in uh, getting truth uh, to the governor and truth to the people who are making the decisions, I think would, uh, would really satisfy it. But, you know, you don't just blindly take away people's rights um, without really investigating the numbers that are being presented. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Rosenberg. Delegate Cox, if I heard you correctly, you said that there were Humvees outside the state house to protect us from the virus. Mm -hmm. Is that your testimony? I filed those photographs with the federal court uh, delegate and uh, they were uh, military vehicles. I believe there were Humvees. Uh, there was two in the front or three, if I recall the photograph correctly. And there was at least one or two in the back. I think most of us re recall that as we left uh, in March of 2020, that was quite shocking to see. So they weren't about any possible threat, physical threat to the state house. Mm -hmm. In March 2020, there was no such threat that we were notified as a, as a state house uh, or as, as a legislator. There was never that. It was a announced state of emergency for the virus. That's all we were ever informed about. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see no further questions from the committee. So that concludes the hearing on House Bill 701 and the uh, work before us today. Um, I will remind folks that we will have bill hearings tomorrow at 1.30. Have a great evening. <laughs>